I don't like to dwell on the past, but our recent move in this brand new space has got me thinking, what if I got some of my previous reviews wrong? If you've heard it once, you've heard it a thousand times. Enthusiasts will tell you the single most important component in any hi-fi or home theater system is your room. It is because of the room that a product can sound one way one minute and completely different the next. And I can attest to this because for more than a month, I have had to endure the ups and downs of getting our new room just right. I've been riding this hi-fi roller coaster with respect to liking and in some instances, just downright hating some of our favorite reference loudspeakers. But now that we have finally got everything dialed in, we thought it would be a good idea to revisit some old favorites to see what's changed and to see where maybe we got it wrong. In our initial review of the Sonus Faber Lumina 2s, I said the Lumina 2 isn't a dry, polite, warm, or reserved loudspeaker. It's engaging. The Lumina 2 is incredibly well-balanced, though not entirely neutral, as there is a bit of top-end emphasis. I went on to say that the Lumina 2 does not play deep, so if you want full-range sound from either your music or movies, the 2s must be paired with a sub. I noted virtually no coloration or editorializing to the mid-range, meaning the 2s earned high marks for me in this regard, though, when it came to the treble, I concluded by saying, I suspect there is a mild to maybe not so mild enhancement of the two's treble response. I don't mind it myself, uh, though I will admit with some recordings and at high volumes, I felt as if the tweeter could get a bit zippy. For a full recap of my initial thoughts on the Lumina 2, feel free to watch my original review, which Christy will link to in the description. But having now listened to them in our new space, I have some additional thoughts. Now, before I get into what's changed, know that our Austin living room had two key issues. First, there was a notable bump in the bass, which could really only be solved by using EQ or digital room correction to eliminate it. And second, speakers that, let's say, may have been designed to have a bit more top end or treble energy were going to be accentuated in our space. As a result, bass heavy speakers, well, they were gonna pick up some added weight. And treble forward speakers, well, they may have come across as too forward or maybe even blistering. Now, I am reminding you of these two attributes because our new room, after our DIY acoustic treatments, exhibits none of these traits and is far more linear or neutral with respect to its interactions with our speakers. So as a result, the Lumina 2s still lack true deep bass and will no doubt require a subwoofer for full range playback down to 20 hertz. The mid-range is still utterly colorless and transparent, resulting in terrific clarity and intelligibility throughout, but it's the treble that I feel I actually need to revise some of my prior critique. The Lumina 2's tweeter in a more balanced room will not encroach upon fatiguing territory when pushed or even when listening to poor recordings. There is actually more refinement and control up top than I previously thought. And as a result, the Lumina 2's, at least in our new space, actually come across as more refined, I know. Because the twos have a soft dome tweeter, the highs, they're gonna be a little bit more breathy with respect to their air versus metallic or ringing, which in the face of sibilance or plosive, actually comes across a tad more grain-like versus glassy, but that's, that's really about it. Soundstage and dynamics-wise, the twos are the same speaker I have always known them to be, which is utterly fantastic, especially for a speaker of this size, not to mention price. So do I still stand by my initial review, not to mention the Lumina 2s today? 100% I do, without hesitation. These are great speakers, period. Well, this one is easy. At the start of my original Model 5 review, I said in no uncertain terms that the fives, well, they were great. I went on to say that while not a true full range loudspeaker, it's 42 Hertz sounds and feels honest. Plus there was just so much raw attack, even at its limits, that it comes across as deeper sounding than it would likely measure. I went on to describe the mid range as neutral without being boring or lifeless. And the treble was as composed, neither forward nor aggressive. Though in brighter leaning rooms, kind of like ours back in Austin, you could use the acoustic compensation switch on the back to curb the treble response if you needed to. Now more than a year later and in our new space, I feel exactly the same about the Model 5 as I did then. It is a fantastic loudspeaker, one whose ultimate sonic signature seems the most unfazed or changed by its environment. It's kind of weird, actually. Of all the speakers we have in our arsenal, the Model 5, at least, has proven to be the most consistent room to room. 
That isn't to say our new space hasn't brought out some improvements. I do believe I'm hearing slightly better coherence from the bass on up to the treble in our new space, not to mention a bit more upper mid-range in treble detail, but it isn't as if the Model 5s sound different or new compared to what I'm used to. Though I still stand by my initial critique that a solid amplifier of 50 or so watts per channel is still required for best results with this particular speaker. But aside from that, the Model 5 still ranks among the better, maybe even the best obtainable three-way speaker you can currently buy. And I'm just as pleased with them today as I was then. In my initial review of Monitor Audio's Silver Series 507G towers, I noted that the 500's cabinet wasn't without some minor resonance, especially around the woofers. But even with that, the bass remained very deep. Now, during the mid-range discussion, I did say that the Monitor Audio's on the whole are going to have a more immediate presence than one that is outright neutral. And what that means is that there's gonna be a little bit more energy in the mid-range as you near the tweeter. And there's definitely just that little spike in energy in the high frequencies with the monitor audios. So in our old space, monitor audio speakers just in general have been dynamic, punchy sounding speakers with a bit of low end emphasis coupled with some mild top end energy. In our new room, this simply is not the case. Well, not entirely. The bass when listening to the monitor audio silver 107G bookshelf speaker still has some audible resonance at the extreme thanks to its rear facing port, but it is still capable of playing satisfyingly deep on its own. The mid range still has terrific presence, one that is ever so slightly forward or resting in line with the speaker's front baffles, but not one that exhibits a great deal of coloration either by design or due to the cabinet construction. When it comes to the tweeter, it would appear that in our new room, the gold dome tweeter of the Silver Series is just a bit more linear than I previously thought. I knew our old space did boost the highs just a bit, and I was very careful in past reviews to share that caveat whenever I felt it was appropriate. But in our new space, I can say without hesitation, the Monitor Audio's Gold Dome tweeter is almost textbook linear, second to only what I've heard and measured from Sonus Faber. My affinity for the Monitor Audio line remains intact, if not a little intensified, for at least with respect to the Silver Series, it would appear you can get reference class performance for reasonable amount of money, and our Silver Series 107G monitors are a great example of this. I don't need to go over my prior review of this speaker. Klipsch has and will remain a love it or hate it brand and no amount of anything I or just anyone else will say is gonna change that for you. All that said, I have always loved the Heresy 4s, though I will admit they are not perfect nor neutral. This is known and I've never attempted to suggest otherwise. In our old room, they could be bright, bordering on harsh with some source material. They could get a little boomy if placed too close to the front wall, resulting in bass that at times was enough that I didn't feel a sub was always required. As for the mid-range, they just, they just have that horn quality, that projection that gives mid-range leaning instruments and vocals a live in-room presence. At least in our old room they did. The Heresy 4 is a speaker that has changed the most for me since the move, but before panic sets in or you all start high-fiving yourselves thinking I'm going to suddenly turn my back on Klipsch, know that while I would not characterize the Heresy 4s quite the same today, they're still excellent. In our new space, I actually like them more because they are proving to be more composed in the upper registers than I would have ever given them credit for. They are not linear, and that is more apparent in the new space as the bass still loads, even in our room, if not placed correctly. And that upper mid-range projection, it's still very much there. But they are far less forward in our new space. In fact, the tweeter is actually a little bit more linear and rolls off sooner than I would have thought, something I was able to measure at my listening position. The Heresy 4s still have that immediacy that I absolutely love, that presence that makes every recording sound more in room than traditional speakers, but in our new space, they're a bit less PA speaker sounding. As for dynamics and scale, they have gotten even better, and I still maintain that watching movies via a Klipsch horn loaded speaker is an experience not soon forgotten. So, is our new room completely done away with the Heresy 4's trademark sound? No. No, it's still there. There's still a mild rise in the bass, not to mention mid-range, but these speakers are far more palpable in the new space than they ever were in our old one, and I loved them 
in the old space. But I have to admit to you, these have proven to be the most temperamental speakers we currently own by a country mile. And it has taken some effort to get them back to what I remember. But now that I have them dialed in, I still absolutely love them. But I understand that they are not going to be everyone's cup of tea. And real quick, if I can catch some of you before you head off into the comments and ask, what about the Forte 4s? We don't have them anymore. What did you say? I sent them back to Klipsch in preparation for something truly special coming to the channel very soon. This was such a fun and eye-opening experience, not to mention experiment for me. I, I was fully prepared to issue any and all necessary retractions or corrections, but for the most part, I think I did a good job preparing you all for what to expect as it relates to these speakers' performance. But I have to say, and I said this to Christy earlier, our new space will allow us to be even better with respect to our critiques of gear in the future. Our new room simply has fewer anomalies that I have to take into account, which in turn makes positives and negatives with respect to a product's performance that much more apparent. Not to say that we, we're the end all be all. These are just our opinions after all. And everyone's tastes, their ears and rooms are going to be different, but at a minimum, we have established a solid baseline, one that I am very happy with, both subjectively and objectively. So that's it for me, but before we sign off, I wonder if Chrissy has anything she would like to add to this little experiment. Oh my God. Um, honestly, like I just have to say that when we first moved into this house mm -hmm. um, and listened to the first pair of speakers that we pulled out, which were the heresies, I mean, yeah. after all, why not pull out, you know, the thing you love. The thing you love. Good old reliable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I freaking panicked. Mm -hmm. it, I was worried. Yes, I you was did. like, holy crap, these sound nothing. I mean, nothing. Like I remembered. And worse, I didn't like them. Mm -hmm. Like at all. Yeah. They were a absolute mess. And honestly, I started to feel like I didn't know sh when it came to this hobby <laughs> all over again mm -hmm. it's it was scary mm -hmm. it was really scary and and yes that was during the time where we didn't have any of our room treatments together mm -hmm. we hardly had any furniture in the space yeah. i mean so i tried really hard not to freak out <laughs> you did you did <laughs> but well. I, I freaked out <laughs> but you know since we've solved most of our room's problems i definitely can say the panic has waned and while they they sound more like I, what I remember, mm -hmm. I know this is going to probably maybe surprise some people or disappoint some people. But if I'm being honest, they mm. have lost a little bit of what I felt made them special back home in Austin, mm. which is so weird hmm. for me. And mm. I'm just I'm still trying to understand how the room is playing a part in that and like what what has changed Um you know, am I, am I just, am I, could I, could it be, you know, another thing I've thought about, could it be that I'm evolving as like, are my tastes, personal tastes evolving? I, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still like in a, in a, in a place where I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. what's happening. Okay. Well, I, I have a few theories. I, uh, I don't think that your tastes are changing because of all of the other experimentations that we've done in this room with respect to um, call it brighter speakers and how you still prefer lighter bass, brighter highs. Um, this room doesn't accentuate uh, brighter speakers the way the old room did. Um, this room is, like I said, it's far more linear, better dampened and things like that. And so as a result, the heresies actually just aren't as bright. And at least at the listening position, when I measured them in this room, um, like I said in the video, they, they roll off um, a I lot think sooner. You said, did you say that? Yeah, yeah, I did. They, the tweeter actually rolls off a lot sooner than I would have expected. And unfortunately, I never actually measured them in Austin. Um, so I don't have a uh, comparison on that particular speaker. I have some comparisons for other ones, but um, yeah. So I think that's what's happening is they've actually become a little bit more composed. I'm not saying that they are neutral. I'm not saying that they somehow measure better. All of the anomalies, the peaks and valleys and things, they're all still there. They, they, they are, um, but they're just not as hot or as spicy as they were 
in Austin with certain recordings, which means I actually like them better here. But if you like that little bit more lively, uh, fun, in your face kind of sound that maybe they can have from time to time in our space, they don't exhibit that trait, which is what I think is happening with you and why they've lost a little bit of their magic is you really like something to grab you. And it's, it really does need to grab you kind of in the tweeter department, um, which these, these don't really do that right now. Now I'm totally with you on the model fives Mm -hmm. switching over to KLH. I, they sound exactly like I remember them. Weird. So, so consistency is yeah. good, I guess. Yeah, totally. You know? <laughs> weird. Very well yeah, designed. Very speaker. weird. Yeah. Like why? I don't know. That's the, again, like w- what's happening? I think the Model Five sealed enclosure may have something to do with that. It has no ports, front or back, so its interactions with the room, I'm not going to say are non-existent, but they are going to be somewhat, you know, minimal. Um, and I think that might be one of the reasons why that speaker is proving to be so darn consistent, but that's really all I got. Cause I would, I would have thought that even without ports, like the treble would measure differently. Mid range would measure. No, that, that is, it is flat. It's weird. Okay. So that leaves me to one other speaker to bring up, which, okay. We really debated about whether or not to even talk about this, but oh, I, it's, no. okay. I, 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 I'll just tell you, I insisted that we go get this speaker again, again, <laughs> not to beat a dead horse. Mm-hmm. That's not what we're trying to do here. Yeah. So, but I, I had, for me, I had to hear it mm-hmm. a, because I knew that you guys would ask and B because I had such a, I don't want to call it like a change of heart, but like just a different experience, just different experience with yeah. the heresies. Yeah. We went out and got the Bowers and Wilkins mm-hmm. 600 series speaker to take a look at again, because to be honest to God, I thought, oh, holy crap, maybe we, maybe we effed up. Like yeah, what maybe if we got it wrong? What if we got it wrong? Mm-hmm. And if we got it wrong, we're going to have to come clean. Mm-hmm. So we went and bought it. Yep. And, um, I, true, truly, I expected to love it. I was like, I, I guarantee you, I'm going to get this speaker in here and it's going to be like my new favorite speaker. And now, and I'm going to have to figure out how to face the world and myself in the mirror. Yeah. Well, okay. First things first, I will admit mm-hmm. I like them better in this room. Okay. Far more than I did back home in Austin. Okay. Makes sense. But they did not magically get rid of all the things I didn't like. There is still too much bass, mm-hmm. and there's zero mid mid range. Yep, they they still gave gave me a little bit of a headache, mm-hmm. but nowhere nearly as bad or as immediate yep. as what happened when we listened to them in Austin. But again, I will say I don't dislike them as much as I did back in Austin. Mm-hmm. I don't think we got the review wrong. No, no, I I don't I don't think we did either because everything that we brought up in that review we are hearing here. We are not hearing it to the same degree. So those of you that have maybe a lot of hard surfaces, brighter leaning rooms, if you were to get the BMWs, I think you are going to have a very similar experience to what we tra- what we communicated to you all in Austin. Now in a much different room, a much larger room, a much more balanced room. Um, all of those things are still there, but I agree with you. I agree with you in that um, they're not quite as aggressive. That said, there is still a massive, and I mean massive, uh, injection of energy in and around that speaker's uh, low frequency range. And it is messy. It is. Um, and the mid range is scooped out, and then there is another second bump uh, in the upper mid range as you get to the tweeter. And it is even more, I, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but it is even more attenuated than the Klipsch Heresy 4s, which also have this trait. Um, they are by far the most energetic tweeter. I'm not talking about rise or um, or accentuation or anything like that. I'm just saying that they are incredibly linear, you know, give or take, you know, half a you know, quarter dB, half a dB, but incredibly linear in the tweeter up and past 20 kilohertz. And I mean, clear past it. 
they don't roll off until way after that 20 kilohertz mark. So like I said in our original BMW review, you know, hey, if you have high frequency hearing loss, these are likely going to be among the most detailed speakers you have probably ever heard. Um, no other speaker that we have in house carries that treble energy across the 20 kilohertz threshold like these do. Um, all that said though, there is so much of a forceful forward presence with these speakers that I noted in the original review that I'm still hearing in this larger space. Everything is front of house and it is bold, big and in your face. But I can see, I can see how some people, some might people like may that. like that. Um, that is not the B and W sound. I have grown up with. This is a new thing for them. This is an incredibly forward, present loudspeaker. And you know, I really feel like if the 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 bass was a little bit more mm -hmm. subdued mm -hmm. and there was more mid-range, mm -hmm. I think I would probably love these speakers. Yeah. If you could fix the mid-range suck and if you were to cross them over 80 to 100 hertz, just basically take whatever it's crossover is doing to the low base, the 40s, 50 hertz range, range, and just cut it out completely. Yeah, you could probably do something with this speaker, but I have to say it has been a, it's been a minute. It's been a minute since a speaker has caused me outright listener fatigue. There's always been a few notes here and there with any speaker or any brighter leaning speaker. Where I'm like, Oh, like, Oh, I didn't like that one, but it's just like a note. It's a fleeting moment listener fatigue sets in for me with these speakers. So I, I still yeah, I did immediately. Yeah. I, I, I still 100% stand by our review. They do, they do fare better in this, in this space, but even the objective measurements in this space, they're still pretty, pretty wonky. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we did it. I'm glad that you suggested it. I'm glad that we went out and found a Best Buy here that had them in stock. <laughs> It's hard to do um, and pick them up because I was, I was curious. And like I said, in the video, I was fully prepared to say, Hey, I got it wrong. Um, but I don't feel like I got this one wrong. I, I still stand by that initial review and I will stand by everything I've just said in this kind of impromptu follow up, follow up review. I, I still don't recommend that speaker, but I can see, I can see how it may have, market appeal for some listeners. All right. Well, that is now our breakdown of how important the room is to hi-fi. What do you guys think? That's our question of the day. Like, what have you noticed uh, when moving your hi-fi equipment around room to room? Or maybe you yourself have moved and maybe you feel differently about your favorite speaker, your favorite amplifier, favorite turntable. Just what changes have you noticed when you've moved rooms with your hi-fi or home theater. Don't want to exclude the home theater people because there are changes there too. Let us know. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Go ahead and ring that bell so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links that Christy left for you down below, know that that is a great way that you've continued to show your support for this channel in the work that we do here. And both of us, thank you very much for doing that. Um, follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audiophile, and that is it for us today. I know Christy already said it, but we have to end on this note, and that is... The only person who has to like the sound of your system is you. So happy listening, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. Bye.